I wonder how many times you've been asked to complete this sort of thing, a questionnaire. When I get them, sometimes I dutifully fill them in and return them, and sometimes I just throw them away. If you sent out a questionnaire, what proportion of useful replies would you expect to get? Not 100%, I'm sure. People who run surveys are keen to get as high a response rate as possible, and they do all they can to achieve this. In one experiment, personally signed letters were sent along with the questionnaires to see if this would encourage people to reply. Here's some of the data. 51 letters were sent, and they got 25 useful replies. What does one really want to find out from this? It's the underlying response rate, the probability that a personally signed letter covering a postal questionnaire of this type, sent to this sort of recipient, will elicit a useful reply. Or, if we'd sent out thousands of such questionnaires, the proportion of useful replies. This proportion is a parameter, P. We don't know its exact value, but we can get an idea of its value from our data. 25 replies out of 51 suggests P must be round about 25 over 51, or 0.49. That's our estimate. But suppose someone else in the next city carried out a similar study, sending, let's say, 68 letters and getting 39 useful replies. This would give a different estimate for P of 39 over 68, or 0.57. We'd have two different estimates of our unknown parameter P, 25 over 51, and 39 over 68, but we get these by the same recipe or estimating formula, which is, observe the number of useful replies R, and divide by the number of letters sent N. R over N is the estimating formula for P. We call it an estimator. With particular data sets, we get particular values of the estimator. For example, 25 over 51 or 39 over 68. These are estimates. This is a simple example, but it has all the essential features of the type of problem we'll be dealing with in the program. An unknown parameter that we wish to estimate. Some data. If we've got no data, then we can't make any estimate. An estimator or estimating formula and the particular number or estimate that it produces from our data. And this technique which we'll be investigating is called point estimation. We've done interval estimation, confidence limits, in Unit 6. Now we'll move on to some other data sets where the estimation problems are rather more interesting. Look at this graph. It shows the number of divorces in England and Wales for each year between 1975 and 1980. In 1975, there were just over 120,000 divorces granted, whilst by 1980, this had risen to almost 150,000. As you can see, for the years in between, there was a steadily rising trend, although it did fall in 1979. Now, it may be that we wish to put a figure to the annual rate of increase of divorces. Why might we wish to do this? Well, for all sorts of reasons. For example, to help in forecasting the future load on the divorce courts. So this is an estimation problem. We wish to estimate the annual rate of increase. How can we make a start on it? Well, we assume that there's a straight line which truly underlies this divorce data. And it's the slope of this line whose value we don't know. How can we estimate this unknown parameter beta? Here are some possible methods. First, we could simply join the first and last points and use the slope of this line as our estimate. We'll denote the slope of this line by the symbol beta 1 hat. The circumflex symbol on top of the beta 1 indicates that this is an estimate for beta. We usually pronounce it beta 1 hat. In fact, with this data, beta 1 hat is 5.6 thousand divorces a year. Now, using rather more than just two of the points, another way of estimating beta. This time, if we join the midpoint of the first two points 
to the midpoint of the last two points, and we get a second estimate with slope beta 2 hat. The slope of this line is 5,000 divorces a year. But we're still not making use of the middle two points, so let's try a third way. We take the triangle connecting the first three data points and find its centre of gravity. That's a sort of average position. Now we'll take the triangle joining the last three data points and find its centre of gravity. Now if we join the two centres of gravity with a line, that will give us a third estimate, beta 3 hat, of the slope. Well, we've managed to estimate the annual rate of increase of divorces in thousands per year. In fact, we've produced not just one estimate, but three, 5.6, 5.0, and 6.0. Which one should we use? Is one of them better than the others? What does better mean? Well, better doesn't refer to a specific value like 5.6 or 5.0, but to the estimating process or procedure which produces such a value. So what we'll need to do is to compare the properties of the various estimators. We'll be doing that a little later, but first, let's look at a third set of data. Here's the next data set. I want to know the miles per gallon performance of my car using lead-free petrol. Here's what I could do. I empty the tank and note the mileage on the clock. Let's say 24361. Here's the point on the graph. I then put five gallons in the tank and run the car until the tank is empty. At that point, I note the mileage again and put a further five gallons in the tank and continue. I repeat this a further three times, and let's suppose I get these values for the mileage against petrol consumption. As you can see, the points are already almost on a straight line. Like we had in the previous data set, we have six data points on a steadily rising trend, and we want to put a figure to the slope because, of course, the slope is the miles per gallon. We'll call the value of the slope we wish to estimate m. And like we did for the previous data set, we can calculate estimates for M by the same three methods. Here are the three values. They're different, though on the graph the lines are almost indistinguishable. We've called them M hats because they're estimates for M. Once again, which of these is best? As we shall see, the best method of estimating M is not the same as the best method of estimating beta. Each estimator, like p hat, is a random variable. It's got a distribution. The estimate, 25 over 51, was an observed value from the distribution for p hat. We've reached the stage where we want to look at the properties of our various estimators. In other words, to find the properties of their distributions. What's our well-tried way of looking at distributions? By simulating them. Let's start with our first data set. Here, we had an estimator p hat for some probability p. Well, as we've done so often before in this course, we'll turn the problem on its head and look at the behavior of the estimator for some known value of p. Let's take the value of p to be 0.5, which is about the right sort of value for the letters data. Then we know r, the number of replies, will be an observation from a binomial distribution B, N, P. We know the number of letters sent N to be 51 and P, 0.5. Our estimator P hat will be large R over N. So we can simulate successive experiments and build up a distribution of P hat. So the first observation in the simulation is R equals 23, giving an estimate P hat of 0.45. Let's enter that value into a histogram and continue simulating further values. We can see that the estimates are centered around the true value of p, 0.5, but nevertheless, there's quite a spread with some estimates quite a way above or below 0.5. It was easy to see how the randomness arose in that situation, but now let's look at the divorce statistics. 
Here are the same data. As you can see, there appears to be an upward trend in the number of divorces. We are assuming that this underlying trend is along a straight line, y equals alpha plus beta x. It's beta, the slope of this line, that we want to estimate. The observed data are scattered above and below this line, and this is where the randomness comes into the model. So we're going to assume that the observed number of divorces in the ith year, yi, is equal to alpha plus beta times xi plus epsilon i. In other words, the number of divorces differs from the y value on the trend line by an amount epsilon i. Epsilon i is a random fluctuation about the line. So each of the epsilon i's will have some probability distribution or other. We're going to assume that the epsilon i's are normally distributed with mean zero and some value of variance, which we'll denote by sigma squared. This implies that all these error terms are from the same distribution. Of course, we don't know the true equation of the line, we don't know the values of alpha and beta, and we don't know sigma squared either. So let's assume some values, then we can simulate some data and get an insight into the process. Let's say alpha is minus 300, beta is 5.5, and we'll give sigma a value of 4, with the x size ranging from 75 to 80. We've chosen these values to correspond pretty well with the divorce data. Now let's clear the board of the real divorce statistics and simulate some data using our model. So let's look at epsilon 1, the error term for the first year, 1975. Now, epsilon 1 is an observation from a normal distribution, so we can use tables of random numbers from a standard normal distribution to obtain a value for epsilon 1. Here's a section from Neve's tables. We'll take a number from the table, 0.3644, and multiply it by our sigma, 4, to get epsilon 1. Multiplying by sigma transforms numbers from the standard normal distribution into random numbers from the normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. So this gives epsilon 1 is 0.3644 times 4, which is about 1.5. So to get our simulated value for 1975, we add this value of epsilon 1 to alpha, that's minus 300, plus beta times x1, which gives 114.0. The units here are thousands, so that gives us our first point, 114,000 divorces. Our second simulated value is y2 equals alpha plus beta times x2 plus epsilon 2. Alpha plus beta x2 is 118, and we get epsilon 2 from the second random number. It's 1.5510 times 4, or 6.2. So the simulated number of divorces for 1976 is 124,200. And here are simulated divorce statistics for the other four years, done in the same way, giving us this set of six points. They're not the same as the six real points, of course. For one thing, the fluctuations are different, and we only guessed at the trend line. But from these points, we can find the estimates beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat, and beta 3 hat for our beta value of 5.5. With the randomness involved, we have to perform the simulation several times to see the pattern emerging. I'll now use this section of random numbers from the normal distribution and generate a further set of data. For 1975, epsilon 1 is 0.5532 times 4, which is 2.2. And my y value is 114.7. And here are the values I get for the remaining years. And again, I could calculate the three estimates for beta. They won't be the same as our first three, 
And of course I can, if I wish, continue generating data in this way and calculate further values for beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat, and beta 3 hat. Let's see what happened when I did. Here is that first set of data we generated. And from this, we can quite easily calculate the three estimates. and their values. We can enter each of these into a histogram. And we can do the same for the second set of data. And continue generating more sets of data and build up three histograms for beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat and beta 3 hat. We can see that each histogram is centred pretty well around the true beta value 5.5 but in one aspect there is a difference between them. Beta 2 hat has considerably less spread than beta 1 hat, with beta 3 hat somewhere in between. So what this means is that if we use beta 2 hat as our estimator, we're more likely to get an estimate close to our true beta than if we use beta 1 hat or beta 3 hat. Actually, it's possible to calculate the variances of the three estimators exactly without any need for simulation. We show you how in the post-program notes. Here are the values of the variances in terms of sigma squared as they come out for this particular model. Beta 2 hat has the smallest variance, as we saw, so it's the most precise of the three estimators. We say that it's more efficient than the others. In fact, with this model, there's an even more efficient estimator than beta 2 hat. It's the least squares estimator. We're not going to show it to you in this TV program, but you'll meet it towards the end of the unit. Some of you have met it already. Now let's move on to the third data set. The model we used for the divorce data isn't suitable for our petrol consumption data. Let's see why. The situation may appear similar, but in fact it isn't. For instance, the first data point here doesn't have any random element at all. It's simply the mileage read from the clock at the beginning. So this point, at zero gallons, is fixed. So we need a different model. And there's another point about this data. You may recall that for the divorce data, there was a fall in the number of divorces in 1979, even though the trend over the whole period was upwards. But with the mileage data, it's simply not possible to have a fall. Once we've recorded a specific number of miles after a certain number of gallons, then it's impossible for the mileage to be below that value after a further five gallons. This is something else we should see reflected by our model. Let's see how we should set this model up. Here are the six data points again, but for the moment we'll concentrate on the first two points. Now we know that the first point at zero gallons is fixed. So we obtain the second point by passing the trend line through the first and adding the random fluctuation. Now let's find the third point from the second. We've already plotted the mileage after five gallons, so any additional random element occurs during the second five gallons. So now we put the trend line through the second point and add a further random fluctuation to obtain the third point. The fluctuation this time is negative. We continue in this way, plotting the trend line through the previous point and adding a random fluctuation to get the next point. So now let's formulate an equation for this model. Y0, the mileage after zero gallons, is fixed. Y1, the mileage after five gallons, is Y0 plus M times X1. X1, of course, is five plus epsilon 1. We got the third point by passing the trend line through the second and adding a further fluctuation, epsilon 2. But we can get to this same point by a slightly different procedure. We can extend the trend line passing through y0, then add on epsilon 1 and then our negative epsilon 2. So the model for y2 is y0 plus m times x2, plus epsilon 1, plus epsilon 2. And in general, this is the model. This model is quite different from the divorce model. 
Once again, we don't know the true value of the slope m, or the value of sigma, although we do know the true value for y0, since this point is fixed. So, as we did before, we'll choose some appropriate values for m and sigma, and simulate some observations. m is 38.2 miles per gallon, and sigma is 15 miles, will serve our purpose. So let's clear the board of the true data. Here again, I have some random numbers from the standard normal distribution. And we calculate our individual epsilon i terms in the same way that we did before. But in order to obtain our y values, we have to accumulate the fluctuations. Of course, our zero term is already known. And there's no fluctuation to add on here. So we'll move on to the next value, the mileage after five gallons. I'll calculate the epsilon 1 term. It's 0.6557 times sigma. That's about 10. Then we add on the term for the underlying line. That's 24361 plus 38.2 times 5, which gives in total 24562. The epsilon 2 term is 0 0.4607 times 15, which is about 7. And to get the fluctuation for 10 gallons, I have to add on the epsilon 1 term. So the next observation is 17 plus the value for the underlying line. So y2 is 24760. Again, I can carry on in this way to generate the complete set of observations. Here they are. And here they are on the graph. And of course, I could calculate my three estimates for m from these observations. Let's have a look at the behavior of the three estimates when we continue generating further observations. Again, each histogram is centered around the true value m equals 38.2. But this time, estimator m1 hat has the smallest spread, and m3 hat has the largest spread. And here again is the true variance of each estimator. So with this model, we get the smallest variance if we use estimator M1 hat. In fact, it's even smaller than the variance of the least squares estimator. Actually, M1 hat is the estimator that anyone would use naturally. It's the slope between the first and last points, and that's simply the total number of miles traveled divided by the total number of gallons used. Which is the best of the three estimators of slope depends on the model. With the divorce data, it was the slope between the two midpoints. So what have we learnt during the program? We've been looking at point estimation, how to assess a value for an unknown parameter. To do this, we need data, and of course, we must choose a sensible probability model for the data. And then, there may be several ways of doing the estimation. If so, we compare these by looking at the variances of the estimators. What we want now is a general method of estimation, and that's what you'll be doing next in the unit.